Book 27 of the Iliad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Iliad by Homer, translated by Samuel Butler. Book 17. Recording by M. L. Cohen. The Light Around the Body of Patroclus. Brave Menelaus, son of Atreus, now came to know that Patroclus had fallen and made his way through the front ranks, clad in full armor to bestride him. As a cow stands lowing over her first calf, even so did yellow-haired Menelaus bestride Patroclus. He held his round shield and his spear in front of him, resolute to kill any who should dare face him. But the son of Pantheos also had noted the body, and came up to Menelaus, saying, Menelaus, son of Atreus, draw back, leave the body, and let the bloodstained spoils be. I was first of the Trojans and their brave allies to drive my spear into Patroclus. Let me, therefore, have my full glory among the Trojans, or I will take aim and kill you. To this Menelaus answered in great anger, By father Joe, boasting is an ill thing. The part is not more bold, nor the lion, nor savage wild boar, which is fiercest and most dauntless of all creatures, than are the proud sons of Panthos. Yet Hyperenor did not see out the days of his youth when he made light of me and withstood me, deeming me mean the meanest soldier among the Danaans. His own feet never bore him back to gladden his wife and parents. Even so shall I make an end of you too, if you withstand me. Get you back into the crowd and do not face me, or it shall be the worse for you. Even a fool may be wise after the event. Euphorbus would not listen and said, now indeed, Menelaus, shall you pay for the death of my brother over whom you vaunted, and whose wife you widowed in her bridal chamber, while you bought grief unspeakable on his parents. I shall comfort these poor people if I bring your head and armor and place them in the hands of Pantheus and noble Phrontis. The time is come when the matter shall be fought out and settled, for me or against me. As he spoke, he struck Menelaus full on the shield, but the spear did not go through, for the shield turned its point. Menelaus then took aim, praying to the father Jove as he did so. Euphorbus was drawing back, and Menelaus struck him about the roots of his throat, leaving his whole weight on the spear so as to drive it home. The point went clean through his neck, and his armor rang rattling round him as he fell heavily to the ground. His hair, which was like that of the graces, and his locks, so deftly bound in bands of silver and gold, were all bedrabbled with blood. As one who has grown a fine young alva tree in a clear space where there is abundance of water, the plant is full of promise, and though the winds beat upon it from every quarter, it puts forth its white blossoms, till the blast of some fierce hurricane sweep down upon it and level it with the ground. Even so did Menelaus strip the fair youth Euphorbus of his armor after he had slain him. Or, as some fierce lion upon the mountains in the pride of his strength fastens on the finest heifer in a herd as it's feeding, first he breaks her neck with his strong jaws, and then gorges on her blood and entrails. Dogs and shepherd raise a hue and cry against him, but they stand aloof and will not come close to him, for they are pale with fear. Even so, no one had the courage to face valiant Menelaus. The son of Atreus would have then carried off the armor of the son of Panthos with ease, had not Phoebus Apollo been angry, and in the guise of Mentes, chief of the Cycons, incited Hector to attack him. Hector, said he, you are now going after the horses of the noble son of Atreus, but you will not take them. They cannot be kept in hand and driven by mortal man, save only by Achilles, who is son to an immortal mother. Meanwhile, Menelaus, son of Atreus, had bestridden the body of Patroclus and killed the noblest of the Trojans, Euphorbus, son of Pantheus, so that he can fight no more. The god then went back into the toil and turmoil, but the soul of Hector was darkened with a cloud of grief. He looked along the ranks and saw Euphorbus lying on the ground with the blood still flowing from his wound, and Menelaus stripping him of his armor. On this, he made his way to the front like a flame of fire, clad in his gleaming armor, and crying with a loud voice. When the son of Atreus heard him, he said to himself in his dismay, Alas, what shall I do? I may not let the Trojans take the armor of Patroclus, who had fallen fighting in my behalf, lest some Danon who sees me should cry shame upon me. Still, if for my honor's sake I fight Hector and the Trojans single-handed, they will prove too many for me, for Hector is bringing them up in force. Why, however, should I thus hesitate? When a man fights in despite of heaven with one whom a god befriends, he will soon rue it. Let no Danon think ill of me if I give place to Hector, for the hand of heaven is with him. Yet, if I could find Ajax, the two of us would fight Hector in heaven too, if we might only save the body of Patroclus for Achilles' son of Peleus. This, of many evils, would be the least. 
While he was thus in two minds, the Trojans came up to him with Hector at their head. He therefore drew back and left the body, turning about like some bearded lion who is being chased by dogs and men from the stockyard with spears and hue and cry, whereupon he is daunted and slinks sulkily off. Even so did Menelaus, son of Atreus, turn and leave the body of Patroclus. When among the body of his men, he looked around for mighty Ajax, son of Telamon, and presently saw him on the extreme left of the fight, cheering on his men and exhorting them to keep on fighting, for Phoebus Apollo had spread a great panic among them. He ran up to him and said, Ajax, my good friend, come with me at once to dead Patroclus. If so be that we may take the body to Achilles, as for his armor, Hector already has it. These words stirred the heart of Ajax, and he made his way among the front ranks, Menelaus going with him. Hector had stripped Patroclus of his armor and was dragging him away to cut off his head and take the body to fling before the dogs of Troy. But Ajax came up with his shield like a wall before him, on which Hector withdrew under shelter of his men, and sprang on to his chariot, giving the armor over to the Trojans to take to the city as a great trophy for himself. Ajax therefore covered the body of Patroclus with his broad shield, and bestrode him as a lion stands over his whelps if hunters have come upon him in a forest when he is with his little ones. In the pride and fierceness of his strength he draws his knit brows down till they cover his eyes. Even so did Ajax bestride the body of Patroclus, and by his side sat Menelaus, son of Atreus, nursing great sorrow in his heart. Then Glaucus, son of Hippolochus, looked fiercely at Hector and rebuked him sternly. Hector, said he, you make a brave show, but in fight you are sadly wanting. A runaway like yourself has no claim to so great a reputation. Think how you may now save your town and citadel by the hands of your own people born in Ilias, for you will get no Lycians to fight for you, seeing what thanks they have had for their incessant hardships. Are you likely, sir, to do anything to help a man of less note after leaving Sarpedon, who was at once your guest and comrade-in-arms, to be the spoil and prey of the Danans? So long as he lived, he did good service both to your city and yourself. Yet you had no stomach to save his body from the dogs. If the Lycians will listen to me, they will go home and leave Troy to its fate. If the Trojans had any of that daring, fearless spirit which lays hold of men who are fighting for their country and harassing those who would attack it, we should soon bear off Patroclus into Ilias. Could we get this dead man away and bring him to the city of Priam? The Argives would readily give up the armor of Sarpedon, and we should get his body to boot. For he whose squire has now been killed is the foremost man at the ships of the Achaeans, he and his close fighting followers. Nevertheless, you dare not make a stand against Ajax, nor face him eye to eye with battle all round you, for he is a braver man than you are. Hector scowled at him and answered, Glaucus, you should know better. I have held you so far as a man of more understanding than any in all Lycia, but now I despise you for saying that I am afraid of Ajax. I fear neither battle nor din of chariots, but Jove's will is stronger than ours. Jove at one time makes even a strong man draw back and snatch his victory from his grasp, while at another he will set him on to fight. Come hither then, my friend. Stand by me and see indeed whether I shall play the coward the whole day through as you say, or whether I shall not stay some even of the boldest Danans from fighting round the body of Patroclus. As he spoke, he called loudly on the Trojans, saying, Trojans, Lycians, and Dardanians! Fighters in close combat, be men, my friends, and fight might and main, while I put on the goodly arm of Achilles, which I took when I killed Patroclus. With this, Hector left the fight, and ran full speed after his men who were taking the arm of Achilles to Troy, but had not yet got far. Standing for a while apart from the woeful fight, he changed his armor. His own he sent to the strong city of Ilias and to the Trojans, while he put on the immortal armor of the son of Peleus, which the gods had given to Peleus, who in his age gave it to his son, but the son did not grow old in his father's armor. When Jove, lord of the storm clouds, saw Hector standing aloof and arming himself in the armor of the son of Peleus, he wagged his head and muttered to himself, Ah, poor wretch, you arm in the armor of a hero, before whom many another trembles and you wreck nothing of the doom that is already close upon you. You have killed his comrade so brave and strong, but it was not well that you should strip the armor from his head and shoulders. I do indeed endow you with a great might now, but as against this you shall not return from battle to lay the armor of the son of Peleus before Andromache. The son of Saturn bowed his pretentious brows, and Hector fitted the army to his body, while terrible Mars entered into him and filled his whole body with might and valor. With a shout he strode in among the allies, and his armor flashed about him, so he seemed to all them like the great son of Peleus himself. He went about among them and cheered them on, 
Nestles, Glaucus, Medon, Theriscles, Ariapius, Decenor, and Hippothus, Phocis, Chromius, and Enemus the Augur. All these did he exhort, saying, Hear me, allies from other cities who are here in your thousands. It was not in order to have a crowd about me that I called you hither each from his several city, but that with heart and soul you might defend the wives and little ones of the Trojans from the fierce Achaeans. For this do I oppress my people with your food and the presents that make you rich. Therefore turn and charge at the foe, to stand or fall as is the game of war, whoever shall bring Patroclus, dead though he be, into the hands of the Trojans, and shall make Ajax give way before him, I will give him one half the spoils, while I keep the other. He will thus share like honor with myself. When he had thus spoken, they charged full weight upon the Danans with their spears held out before them, and the hopes of each ran high that he should force Ajax, son of Telamon, to yield up the body. Fools that they were, for he was about to take the lives of many. Then Ajax said to Menelaus, My good friend Menelaus, you and I shall hardly come out of this fight alive. I am less concerned for the body of Patroclus, who will shortly become meat for the dogs and vultures of Troy, than for the safety of my own head and yours. Hector has wrapped us round in a storm of battle from every quarter, and our destruction seems now certain. Call then upon the princes of the Danans, if there is any who can hear us. Menelaus did as he said, and shouted to the Danans for help at the top of his voice. My friends, he cried, princes and counselors of the Argives, all you were with Agamemnon and Menelaus drink at the public cost, and give orders each to his own people as Jove vouchsafes him power and glory. The fight is so thick about me that I cannot distinguish you severally. Come on, therefore, every man unbidden, and think it shame that Patroclus should become meat and morsel for Trojan hounds. Fleet Ajax, son of Oileus, heard him, and was first to force his way through the fight and run to help him. Next came Idomeneus and Meriones, his esquire, peer of murderous Mars. As for the others that came into the fight after theirs, who of his own self could name them? The Trojans with Hector at their head charged in a body, as a great wave that comes thundering in at the mouth of some heaven-born river, and the rocks that jut into the sea ring with a roar of breakers that beat and buffet them. Even with such a roar did the Trojans come on. But the Achaeans in singleness of heart stood firm about the son of Minotius, and fenced him in with their bronze shields. Jove, moreover, hid the brightness of their helmets in a thick cloud, for he had borne no grudge against the son of Minotius while he was still alive, and squire to the descendant of Achaeus. Therefore he was loath to let him fall prey to the dogs of his foes the Trojans, and urged his comrades on to defend him. At first the Trojans drove the Achaeans back, and they withdrew from the dead man daunted. The Trojans did not succeed in killing anyone, nevertheless they drew the body away. But the Achaeans did not lose it long, for Ajax, foremost of all the Danans after the son of Peleus, alike in stature and prowess, quickly rallied them, and made towards the front like a wild boar upon the mountain, when he stands at bay in the forest glades, and routs the hounds and lusty youths that have attacked him. Even so did Ajax, son of Telamon, passing easily among the phalanxes of the Trojans, disperse those who had bestridden Patroclus, and who were most bent on winning glory by dragging him off to their city. At this moment, Hippothus, brave son of Pegasus and Lethius, in his zeal for Hector and the Trojans, was dragging the body off by the foot through the press of the fight, having bound a strap round the sinews near the ankle. But a mischief soon befell him from which none of those could save him who had gladly done so, for the son of Telamon sprang forward and smote him on his brown-cheeked helmet. The plumed headpiece broke about the point of the weapon, struck at once by the spear and by the strong hand of Ajax, so that the bloody brain came oozing out through the crest socket. His strength then failed him, and he let Patroclus' foot drop from his hand, as he fell full length dead upon the body. Thus he died far from the fertile land of Larissa, and never repaid his parents the cost of bringing him up, for his life was cut short early by the spear of mighty Ajax. Hector then took aim at Ajax with a spear, but he saw it coming and just managed to avoid it. The spear passed on and struck Sidious, son of noble Iphthius, captain of the Phocians, who dwelt in famed Panopeus and reigned over much people. It struck him under the middle of the collarbone, the bronze point went right through him, coming out the bottom of his shoulder blade, and his armor rang rattling round him as he fell heavily to the ground. Ajax in his turn struck noble Phorcys, son of Phenops, in the middle of his belly as he was bestriding Hippothus, and broke the plate of his cuirass, whereupon the spear tore out his entrails, and he clutched the ground in the palm as he fell to the earth. Hector and those who were in the front rank then gave ground, while the Argives raised a loud cry of triumph and drew off the bodies of Phorcys and Hippothus, which they stripped presently of their armor. 
The Trojans, who had now been worsted by the brave Achaeans and driven back to Ilias through their own cowardice, while the Argives, so great was their courage and endurance, would have achieved a triumph even against the will of Jove, if Apollo had not roused Aeneas, in the likeness of Paraphius, son of Epteus, an attendant who had grown old in the service of Aeneas's aged father, and was at all times devoted to him. In his likeness, then, Apollo said, Aeneas, can you not manage, even though heaven be against us, to save high Ilias? I have known men whose numbers, courage, and self-reliance have saved their people in spite of Jove, whereas in this case he would much rather give victory to us than to the Danans, if you would only fight instead of being so terribly afraid. Aeneas knew Apollo when he looked straight at him and shouted to Hector, saying, Hector and all other Trojans and allies, shame on us if we are beaten by the Achaeans and driven back to Ilias through our own cowardice. A god has just come up to me and told me that Jove the Supreme Disposer will be with us. Therefore, let us make for the Danans that it may go hard with them ere they bear away dead Procrocolus to their ships. As he spoke, he sprang out far in front of the others, who then rallied and again faced the Achaeans. Aeneas speared Leoctorus, son of Arisbus, a valiant follower of Lycomedes, and Lycomedes was moved with pity as he saw him fall. He therefore went close up and speared Apassian, son of Hippasius, shepherd of his people under the liver in a midriff, so that he died. He had come from fertile Paeonia, and was the best man of all of them after Asteropius. Asteropius flew forward to avenge him and attack the Danans, but this might no longer be, inasmuch as those about Patroclus were well covered by their shields, and held their spears in front of them. For Ajax had given them strict orders that no man was either to give ground or to stand out before the others, for all were to hold well together about the body and fight hand to hand. Thus did huge Ajax bid them, and the earth ran red with blood as the corpses fell thick on one another alike the side of the Trojans and allies, and on that of the Danans. For these last two fought no bloodless fight, though many fewer of them perished, through the care they took to defend and stand by one another. Thus did they fight as it were a flaming fire. It seemed as though it had gone hard even with the sun and moon, for they were hidden over all that part where the bravest heroes were fighting about the den of Menelaus, where the other Danans and Achaeans fought at their ease in full daylight with bright sunshine all round them, and there was not a cloud to be seen neither on plain nor mountain. These last more would rest for a while and leave off fighting, for they were some distance apart and beyond the range of one another's weapons, whereas those who were in the thick of the fray suffered both from battle and darkness. All the best of them were being worn out by the great weight of their armor, but the two valiant heroes, Thrasymedes and Antilochus, had not yet heard of the death of Patroclus, and believed him still to be alive and leading the van against the Trojans. They were keeping themselves in reserve against the death or rout of their own comrades, for so Nestor had ordered when he sent them from the ships into battle. Thus, through the livelong day, did they wage fierce war, and the sweat of their toil rained ever on their legs under them and on their hands and eyes as they fought over the squire of the fleet son of Peleus. It was as when a man gives a great oxhide all drenched in fat to his men, and bids them stretch it, whereupon they stand rounded in a ring and tug till the moisture leaves it, and the fat soaks in for the many that pull at it, and it is well stretched. Even so did the two sides tug the dead body hither and thither within the compass of but a little space. The Trojans steadfastly set on dragging it into Ilias, while the Achaeans were no less so on taking it to their ships, and fierce was the fight between them. Not Mars himself, lord of hosts, nor yet Minerva, even in their fullest fury, could make light of such a battle. Such fear for turmoil of men and horses did Jove on that day ordain round the body of Patroclus. Meanwhile, Achilles did not know that he had fallen, for the fight was under the wall of Troy a long way off from the ships. He had no idea, therefore, that Patroclus was dead and deemed that he would return alive as soon as he had gone close up to the gates. He knew that he was not to sack the city neither with nor without himself, for his mother had often told him this when he sat alone with her, and she had informed him of the counsels of great Jove. Now, however, she had not told him how a great disaster had befallen him of the death of the one who was far dearest to him of all his comrades. The others still kept on charging one another round the body with their pointed spears and killing each other. Then one would say, My friends, we can never again show our faces at the ships. Better, and greatly better, that the earth should open and swallow us here in this place, that we should let the Trojans have the triumph of bearing off Patroclus to their city. The Trojans also on their part spoke to one another, saying, Friends, though we fall to a man beside this body, let none shrink from fighting. With such words did they exhort each other. They fought and fought, and an iron clank rose through the void air to the brazen vault of heaven. 
the horses of the descendant of Asia stood out in fight and wept when they heard that their driver had been laid low by the hand of murderous Hector. Automedon, valiant son of Diores, lashed them again and again. Many a time did he speak kindly to them, and many a time did he upbraid them. But they would neither go back to the ships by the waters of the broad Hellespont, nor yet into battle among the Achaeans. They stood with their chariots stock still, as a pillar set over a tomb of some dead man or woman, and bowed their heads to the ground. Hot tears fell from their eyes as they mourned the loss of their charioteer, and their noble manes drooped all wet from under the yoke straps on either side of the yoke. The son of Saturn saw them and took pity upon their sorrow. He wagged his head and muttered to himself, saying, Poor things, why did we give you to King Peleus, who is immortal, while you are yourselves ageless and immortal? What is that you might share the sorrows that befall mankind? For of all creatures that live and move upon the earth, there is none so pitiable as he is. Still Hector, son of Priam, shall drive neither you nor your chariot. I will not have it. It is enough that he should have the armor over which he vaunts so vainly. Furthermore, I will give you strength of heart and limb to bear Otimedon safely to the ships from battle, for I shall let the Trojans try him still further, and go on killing till they reach the ships, whereupon night shall fall and darkness overshadow the land. As he spoke, he breathed heart and strength into the horses so that they shook the dust from out of their manes and bore their chariots swiftly into the fight that raged between Trojans and Achaeans. Behind them fought Automedon, full of sorrow for his comrade, as a vulture amid a flight of geese. In and out, here and there, full speed he dashed amid the throng of the Trojans, but for all the fury of his pursuit he killed no man, for he could not wield his spear and keep his horses in hand. When alone in the chariot, at last, however, a comrade, Alcimedon, son of Laerces, son of Haman, caught sight of him and came up behind his chariot. Automedon, said he, what god has put this folly into your heart and robbed you of your right mind, that you fight the Trojans in the front rank single-handed? He who was your comrade is slain, and Hector plumes himself on being armed in the armor of the descendant of Aeacus. Automedon, son of Diores, answered, Alcimedon, there is no one else who can control and guide the immortal steed so well as you can, save only Patroclus, while he was alive, peer of gods and counsel. Take the whip and reins while I go from the car and fight. Alcimedon sprung onto the chariot and caught up in the whips and reins, while Automedon leaped from off the car. When Hector saw him, he said to Aeneas who was near him, Aeneas, counselor of the Malagad Trojans, I see the steeds of the fleet son of Aeacus coming into battle with weak hands to drive them. I am sure, if you think well, that we might take them. They will not dare face us if we both attack them. The valiant son of Anchises was of the same mind, and the pair went right on with their shoulders covered under shields of tough dry oxide overlaid with much browns. Chromius and Aretas went along with them, and their hearts beat high with the hope that they might kill the men and capture the horses, fools that they were, for they were not to return scatheless from their meeting with Automedon, who prayed to his father Jove and was forthwith filled with courage and strength abounding. He turned to his trusty comrade Alcimedon and said, Alcimedon! Keep your horses so close up that I may feel their breath upon my back. I doubt that we shall not stay Hector, son of Priam, till he has killed us and mounted behind the horses. He will then either spread panic among the ranks of the Achaeans, or himself be killed among the foremost. On this he cried out to the two Ajaxes and Menelaus. Ajaxes, captain of the Argives, and Menelaus, give the dead body over to them that were best able to defend it, and come to the rescue of us living. For Hector and Aeneas are the two best men among the Trojans, are pressing us hard in the full tide of war. Nevertheless, the issue lies in the lap of heaven. I will therefore hurl my spear and leave no rest to Jove. He poised and hurled as he spoke, whereon the spear struck the round shield of Aretas, and went right through it, for the shield stayed it not, so it was driven through his belt into the lower part of his belly. As when some sturdy youth, axe in hand, deals his blow behind the horns of an ox, and severs the tendons at the back of its neck so that it springs forward and then drops, even so did Aratus give one bound, and then fall on his back, the spear quivering in his body, till it made an end of him. Hector then aimed a spear at Automedon, but he saw it coming, and stooped forward to avoid it, so that it flew past him, and the point struck in the ground, while the butt end went on quivering till Mars robbed it of its force. They would then have fought hand to hand with swords had not the two Ajaxes forced their way through the crowd when they heard their comrades calling and parted them for all their fury. For Hector, Aeneas, and Chromius were afraid and drew back, leaving Aretas to lie there struck to the heart. Automedon, peer of fleet Mars, then stripped him of his armor and vaunted over him, saying, 
I have done little to assuage my sorrow for the son of Moses, for the man I have killed is not so good as he was. As he spoke, he took the bloodstained spoils and laid them upon his chariot. Then he mounted the car with his hands and feet all steeped in gore, as a lion that has been gorging upon a bull. And now the fierce, groanful fight again raged about Patroclus, for Minerva came down from heaven and roused his fury by the command of far-seeing Jove, who had changed his mind and sent her to encourage the Danans. As when Jove bends his bright bow in the heaven to token to mankind neither of war or of the chill storms that stay men from their labor and plague the flocks, even so, wrapped in such radiant raiment, did Minerva go in among the host and speak man by man to each. First she took the form and voice of Phoenix, and spoke to Menelaus, son of Atreus, who was standing near her. Menelaus, said she, it will be a shame and dishonor to you if the dogs tear the noble comrade of Achilles under the walls of Troy. Therefore be staunch, and urge your men to be so also. Menelaus answered, Phoenix, my good old friend, may Minerva vouchsafe me strength, and keep the darts from off me, for so I shall stand by Patroclus and defend him. His death has gone to my heart. But Hector is as a raging fire and deals his blow without ceasing, for Jove is now granting him a time of triumph. Minerva was pleased at his having named herself before any other of the gods. Therefore she put strength into his knees and shoulders, and made him as bold as a fly, which, though driven off the will, yet come again and bite if it can, so dearly does it love man's blood. Even so bold as this did she make him as he stood over Patroclus and threw his spear. Now there was among the Trojans a man named Podes, son of Etion, who was both rich and valiant. Hector held him in the highest honor, for he was a comrade and boon companion. The spear of Menelaus struck this man in a girdle just as he had turned in flight, and went right through him. Whereon he fell heavily forward, and Menelaus, son of Atreus, drew off his body from the Trojans into the ranks of his own people. Apollo then went up to Hector and spurred him on to fight, in the likeness of Phaenops, son of Asius, who had lived in Abydos and was the most favored of all Hectored guests. In his likeness, Apollo said, Hector, who of the Achaeans will fear you henceforward now that you have quailed before Menelaus, who has ever been rated poorly as a soldier? Yet he now has a corpse away from the Trojans single-handed, and slain your own true comrade, a man brave among the foremost, Podes, son of Adion. A dark cloud of grief fell upon Hector as he heard, and he made his way to the front clad in full armor. Thereon the son of Saturn seized his bright-tasseled Aegis, and veiled Ida in a cloud. He sent forth his lightning and his thunders, and as he shook his Aegis, he gave victory to the Trojans and routed the Achaeans. The panic was begun by Peneleus the Boeotian, for while keeping his face turned ever towards the foe, he had been hit with a spear on the upper part of the shoulder. A spear thrown by Polydamus had grazed the top of his bone, for Polydamus had come up to him and struck him from close at hand. Then Hector, in close combat, struck Letius, son of noble Asitrion, in the hand by the wrist, and disabled him from fighting further. He looked about him in dismay, knowing that never again should he wield spear in battle with the Trojans. While Hector was in pursuit of Letius, Idomeneus struck him on the breastplate over his chest near the nipple, but the spear broke in the shaft, and the Trojans cheered aloud. Hector then aimed at Idomeneus, son of Deucalion, as he was standing on his chariot, and very narrowly missed him. But the spear hit Corianus, follow and charioteer of Meriones, who had come with him from Lictius. Idomeneus had left the ships on foot, and would have afforded a great triumph to the Trojans if Corianus had not driven quickly up to him. He therefore brought life and rescue to Idomeneus, but himself fell by the hand of murderous Hector. For Hector hit him on the jaw under the ear. The end of the spear drove out his teeth and cut his tongue in two pieces so that he fell from his chariot and let the reins fall to the ground. Meriones gathered them up from the ground and took them into his own hands. Then he said to Inomenius, Lay on till you get back to the ships, for you must see that the day is no longer ours. On this, Idomeneus lashed the horses to the ships, for fear had taken hold upon him. Ajax and Menelaus noted how Job had turned the scale in favor of the Trojans, and Ajax was the first to speak. Alas, said he, even a fool may see that Father Jove is helping the Trojans. All their weapons strike home, no matter whether it be a brave man or a coward that hurls them. Jove speeds all alike, where ours fall, each one of them without effect. What, then, will be best, both as regards rescuing the body and our return to the joy of our friends, who will be grieving as they look hitherwards? For they will make sure that nothing can now check the terrible hands of Hector, and that he will fling himself upon our ships. I wish that someone would go and tell the son of Peleus at once, for I do not think that he can yet have heard the sad news that the dearest of his friends has fallen. 
but I can see not a man among the Achaeans to send, for they and their charioteers are all alike hidden in darkness. O oh, Father Jove, lift this cloud from over the sons of the Achaeans, make heaven serene, and let us see, if you will, that we perish. Let us fall at any rate by daylight. Father Jove heard him, and had compassion upon his tears. Forthwith he chased away the cloud of darkness, so that the sun shone out and all the fighting was revealed. Ajax then said to Menelaus, Look, Menelaus, and if Antilochus' son of Nestor be still living, send him at once to tell Achilles that by far the dearest to him of all his comrades has fallen. Menelaus heeded his words and went his way as a line from a stockyard. The lion is tired of attacking the men and hounds, who keep watch the whole night through and will not let him feast on the fat of their herd. In his lust of meat he makes straight at them but in vain, for darts from strong hands assail them, and burning brands which daunt him for all his hunger. So in the morning he slinks sulkily away. Even so did Menelaus sorely against his will leave Patroclus, in great fear lest the Achaeans should be driven back in rout and let him fall into the hands of the foe. He charged Meriones and the two Ajaxes straightly, saying, Ajaxes and Meriones, leaders of the Argives, now indeed remember how good Patroclus was. He was ever courteous while alive. Bear it in mind now that he is dead. With this Menelaus left them, looking round as keenly as an eagle, whose sight, they say, is keener than of any other bird, however high he may be in the heavens. Not a hare that runs can escape him by crouching under the bush or thicket, for he will swoop down upon it and make an end of it. Even so, O Menelaus, did your keen eyes range round the mighty host of your followers to see if you could find the son of Nestor still alive. Presently Menelaus saw him in the extreme left of the battle, cheering on his men and exhorting them to fight boldly. Menelaus went up to him and said, Antilochus, come here and listen to sad news, which I would indeed were untrue. You must see with your own eyes that heaven is heaping calamity upon the Danians and giving victory to the Trojans. Patroclus has fallen who was the bravest of the Achaeans, and sorely will the Danans miss him. Run instantly to the ships and tell Achilles that he may come to rescue the body and bear it to the ships. As for the armor, Hector already has it. Antilochus was struck with horror. For a long time he was speechless, his eyes filled with tears, and he could find no utterance. But he did as Menelaus had said, and set off running as soon as he had given his armor to a comrade, Laodicus who was wheeling his horse round close behind him. Thus then did he run weeping from the field to carry the bad news to Achilles son of Peleus. Nor were you, O Menelaus, minded to succor his harried comrades when Antilochus had left the Pylians, and greatly did they miss him. But he sent them noble Thrasymedes, and himself went back to Patroclus. He came running up to the two Ajaxons and said, I have sent Antilochus to the ship to tell Achilles, but rage against Hector as he may, he cannot come, for he cannot fight without armor. What then will be our best plan, both as regards rescuing the dead and our own escape from death among the battle cry of the Trojans? Ajax answered, Menelaus, you have said well. Do you then, and Meriones stoop down, raise the body and bear it out of the fray, while we two behind you keep off Hector and the Trojans, one in heart as in name, and long used to fighting side by side with one another. On this Menelaus and Meriones took the dead man in their arms and lifted him high aloft with a great effort. The Trojan host raised a hue and cry behind them when they saw the Achaeans bearing the body away, and flew after them like hounds attacking a wounded bear at the loo of a band of young huntsmen. For while the hounds fly at him as though they would tear him to pieces, but now and again he turns on them in a fury, scarring and scattering them in all directions, even so did the Trojans for a while charge in a body, striking with sword and spears pointed at both ends. But when the two Ajaxes faced them and stood at bay, they would turn pale, and no man dared press on to fight further about the dead. In this wise did the two heroes strain every nerve to bear the body to the ships out of the fight. The battle raged round them like fierce flames that when once kindled spread like wildfire over a city, and the houses fall in the glare of its burning. Even such was the roar and tramp of men and horses that pursued them as they bore Patroclus from the field. Or as mules that put forth all their strength to draw some beam of a great piece of ship's timber down a rough mountain track, and they pant and sweat as they go, even so did Menelaus and pant and sweat as they borne the body of Patroclus. Behind them, the two Ajaxes held stoutly out, as some wooded mountain spur that stretches across a plain will turn water and check the flow even of a great river. 
nor is there any stream strong enough to break through it even so did the two ajaxes face the trojans and stern the tide of their fighting though they kept pouring on towards them and foremost among them all was aeneas son of anchises with valiant hector as a flock of daws or starlings fall to screaming and chattering when they see a falcon foe to all small birds come soaring near them even so did the achaean youth raise a babble of cries as they fled before aeneas and hector unmindful of their former prowess in the rout of the danians much goodly armor fell round about the trench and of fighting there was no end end of book seventeen recording by m l cohen www.mojomove411.com, Cleveland, Ohio, November 2007.